1 John chapter 5, we want to pick up where we left off last week. And we'll use the time that we have. And if we get any further, then we will. And if we don't, that's all right too. Lord willing, we'll come back and we'll pick it up next week. Um, but I want to do these final verses justice. And so as we near the end of this verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 John, we're going to once again read the last verses in this book, 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. And so as you find your place, please stand as we read these verses together. Last week we only looked at verse 13, and uh, we'll see how far we get today. 1 John 5, beginning in verse 13, this is the reading of God's Word. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give for him, excuse me, God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Thank you. You may be seated. Last week in the introduction, I just brought to your attention something that we all understand and know, and that is that we live in a world of uncertainties. It is because we are uncertain of what tomorrow may hold and what may come our way that we even have things such as health insurance, life insurance, uh, disability insurances, and on and on. It's the reason why we save and put back. We want to be prepared for whatever may come our way. And yet, in a world of uncertainties, there are some things we can be very certain of. And one of those things is that even though we do not know what tomorrow holds, we know who holds tomorrow. We know the one true living God who is absolutely sovereign, who rules and reigns from his throne, and that because he is the one true living God who rules and reigns, that we can have absolute confidence that whatever comes our way, it is in the will of God, and that in his providence, whatever he has decreed will come about. Well, it is precisely for that reason that John's written this epistle. He tells us that he... Uh, that the Christian, rather, can have these certainties, these comforts. And as he writes this letter, he is driving home these points. He's coming and circling back around. And each time he does, he's driving the truth a little bit deeper, a little bit further as to how we can know that we know the Lord. And so even in these verses, just to quickly if you were not here last week, just to quickly bring your eyes through there, just look how many times the word no is mentioned in these verses. It's several times. And then in verse 14, the word confidence that is mentioned. These verses, these closing comments are all about the certainties and comforts that we can have as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. John, as he brings his letter to an end, is giving powerful and purposeful conclusions that will leave his readers, that will leave these followers of Christ with great confidence. And so this morning, once again, Christian Comforts and Certainties is the title of the message. And last week, what we saw is that 
we can have assurance of eternal life. We saw this in verse 13. I'll not re-preach verse 13, but for those of you who are not here, let me at least skim the surface. John says these things, referring to everything he has written so far, he said, I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to Christians so that, he says, you may know that you have eternal life. And this word know that we will see so many times in these verses is an assurance, a knowledge that is characterized by certainty. In other words, John's not saying that you just have a mental knowledge of it, but that you have this knowledge and that it is characterized by certainty. And this assurance is not merely positive thinking. It's not merely wishful thinking. It is Facts. It's not based upon feelings. It's based upon the facts of the Word of God. And so he says, you can know that you have eternal life. And we noted last week that this eternal life is not only the quantity of life that we will live forever, but the quality of that life in the presence of the Lord. That we so... Uh, as as uh, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when he talks about uh, the resurrection taking place, and he says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because not only will we, will we exist forever, but there will be a quality of that life in the presence of the Lord as we shall Spend eternity with God. Last week there were six things that we did in review to the entire book. I want to just read those to you because this morning I want you to examine yourself by them. John says, if your life lines up with these things, the things that he has written, you can know you have eternal life. You can have assurance of salvation. What are they? Number one, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? We see that in places such as chapter 5, verse 1. Number two, do you confess your sin? Do you recognize your sin as God recognizes your sin? That's chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Number three, do you keep God's commandments? Chapter 2, verse 3, do you strive to keep your life in alignment with the Word of God? Number four, do you love God's people? Chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, is there not only a love for God, but also a love for God's people? people. Number five, do you practice righteousness rather than sin? Chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Is your life characterized by striving and pushing and pressing toward righteousness and producing righteousness, or is your life characterized by sin? Number six, do you have the inner witness of the Spirit? Does God's Spirit bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? If you can answer yes to all of these questions, then there is assurance, John has said, that you are saved. You can know. And every one of those questions are very relevant and significant questions that need to be answered because every individual is instructed in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 to test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. And so number one, a Christian comfort and certainty that John wants his readers to leave with is that you can know. Say, preacher, how many times are you going to say that? As many as it takes. Because there should be an assurance of your salvation. Number two, in verses 14 through 17, we see that another certainty and comfort that John leaves his readers with is the fact that there is answered prayer. And so as I've already mentioned in the previous message, eternal life with God in heaven is something that the believer possesses now in this life. We have eternal life. However, it's very obvious we're not there yet, right? We're not in heaven yet. And so we're still in this world. And so in these next few verses, John reminds his readers 
of the confidence that is theirs concerning the full access, the full access that we have to God and His resources while we are still in this life through prayer. Through prayer, John says, even though we possess eternal life, we will one day be with him in heaven, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're not there yet, but until we get there, we have full access to the throne of God, to, the, uh, to, to all the resources of God, his strength, his comfort, his grace, his mercy, his love, whatever the case may be, through prayer. Now look at verse 14. Verse 14, under heading number 2, answered prayer. This is the confidence which we have before him. This is the fourth time that the word confidence is used in this letter. And every time where the word confidence is used, it is referring to Godward. Godward confidence that is grounded in a relationship with him. In other words, our confidence is rooted in God and it is God word. It is not, it is not horizontal in, in man or some institution. It is God word confidence that we have. And the word literally means all speech, confidence, all speech, freedom of speech. It's also translated in the Bible, this Greek word is translated boldness. And so the confidence that we have in his presence, the verse says, verse 14, before him when we pray is all assurance. Look at uh, Ephes uh, Hebrews rather, chapter 4, verse 16. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, let us draw near with what? With confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's the same word. It's exactly what John is writing about right here, that this is the confidence which we have before him. What? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now that's a wonderful comfort, isn't it? Does that not give you comfort as a believer? Does that not give you assurance and bring about a certainty to your life, to your Christian life, to your walk of faith with the Lord Jesus Christ here in this life, that we can have confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Anything. And that anything is qualified by the next phrase which says according to his will. In other words, whatever we pray, listen to me now, whatever we pray that is in alignment with and in harmony with God's will, he hears us and answers us. This is why we're to pray, as we're taught in the Word of God, not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. Look at the next verse. And if, which is to say since, and since we know, there's that word again, the knowledge characterized by certainty, and since we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, now listen, this is way more than God just being consciously aware of our request. This is God favorably hearing what we ask for because it is in accordance with his will. Therefore, if we know that he hears us, verse 15, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. This is to say God answers the prayers of his people 
who pray according to his will. This is a comforting certainty for every Christian. And because of the way John has written this in the present tense, that use of the language implies that this is the ongoing the ongoing experience of every true Christian. That every true follower of Christ, as they are praying and communing with God, can have the ongoing experience of God hearing their prayers and answering their prayers and seeing those answered prayers come to fruition in their life. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Y'all catching up on sleep? Amen. That's, that's, that's glorious news. That's wonderful. But let's be careful, let's be careful not to stray and stretch the Word of God as many false teachers have to say that this therefore means that we can ask for whatever we want and we can pray for whatever we want and God is bound and obligated to do it. What have we understood, what have we learned as we've looked at how to study the Bible? That the best interpreter of Scripture is not the best commentary. It is not any man. The best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. And so we study the whole counsel of God and we pull it together and we, we look at verses like our text to mor this morning that if we ask anything according to his will and according to his will is the qualifier. And the qualifier, the key note, in John 14 is if you ask anything in my name. In my name is the key prepositional phrase. In my name. If he would have just said, if you ask anything, I will do it, that'd be a blank check. That'd be a blank check for God to be obligated to do anything. But in my name means... That if you ask anything in alignment, in harmony with who he is. In alignment, in harmony with who Jesus Christ is. If you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord will do what? The Bible says. Give you the desires of your heart. But before the desires of your heart are given... You are first, the prerequisite is that you what? That you delight in the Lord. And so what Scripture is saying is, is that God hears his people and God answers his people. And when his people are delighting in him, loving him, putting him first, praying in harmony with who he is and what his heart is, God's heart is, and according to his will, and all of these things, of course God's going to answer those prayers because their desires, my desires, line up with God's desires. You see? Doesn't that make sense? If we need it, God's going to see to it that we have it. But if we become selfish, if we become greedy, if we have ulterior motives that are really different channels to try to bring about someone else's ill will or harm or indifference, whatever, into their life, God knows our hearts. And so many times the proverbial example is that means you can't just pray for a Cadillac and that means God's obligated to give it. Now you need a Cadillac and that's exactly what you need. My God can provide it. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He owns the hills and the taters under those hills. He owns it all. He can do it. But the point here is that as Christians and as believers, we're to be what? 
We are to be putting on the mind of Christ. We are to be girding up the loins uh, of our minds with truth. We are to be feeding upon the Word of God. We are to be uh, praying and communing with God. Our heart is to be His heart. Uh, his heart is to be our heart, better said that way, uh, that, that his passion should be our passions, his will should be our will. We should be pursuing those things that honor and glorify God. And when you have a heart, a mind, a spirit that is like that, 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 that structures, that brings about a framework to how you pray, you see. And so while on the subject of prayer, having said that we can have confidence that whatever we ask according to his will, God hears us. And since we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have those requests. While on this subject of prayer, John now turns to the subject of intercessory prayer in the next two verses, and by doing so, John gives us an example of how the Lord answers prayers on behalf of someone else. In verse 16, we see the reason or the response of intercession. You see the beginning of verse 16? If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask John is setting forth a very real, a very likely, hypothetical scenario before us. And what he's doing is he's pointing out, will you hear me? He's pointing out the responsibility of every Christian to pray for their brother that they see sinning. Now we live in a very consumeristic church age. I mean, how would you feel? Let me give you an example of consumeristic mindset. How would you feel if when you stood at the register at your favorite grocery store, and let's just say your indulgence is a really sugary, unhealthy cereal, fruity pebbles, those things are good. And you have them on the counter, and the person checking you out says, do you really think you need these? Don't you think you should go with the plain Cheerios that are healthy for the heart? You would say, what? That's none of your business. You're just here to serve me. Check me out. Mind your own business. That same mentality has come into the church. Because church culture in America especially has turned into consumeristic rather than a community. The Bible teaches that we are to be a community. We are a covenant community. That we are to pray for one another. We are to bear one another's burdens. We are to, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to mourn with those who mourn. We are to come alongside one another. In our text right now, we are to pray for our brother that we see sinning. He says, if anyone, that means not just the preacher, not just the pastor, not just the deacons, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask. It is our obligation because we are a part of the same body and that body is Christ's body. He is the head. And we are to come alongside one another to, to, to help one another uh, to prevent from falling, from stumbling, to keep from bringing reproach upon the name of Christ. All of these things. And so then he goes into the second part of verse 16, the result of the intercession. The reason is because his brother is committing a sin. And our response, verse 16, the beginning part, is that we are to ask. Now look at the result. The result in the beginning of verse 16 is, and God will for him, for the one praying, for the intercessor, give life. In other words, God will restore the life that is being threatened by sin. 
That life doesn't necessarily mean physical life as though someone were physically dying. But what we do know is this, that the, life, the joy, life, life and life more what? Abundantly. What is ours in Christ? And God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. This is just teaching us that God honors the intercessory prayer that is rendered because it is God's will that we intercede for one another. It is God's will that we pray for one another. And I can say with absolute confidence and authority that it is God's will because the Bible explicitly says it's God's will. Now, I get a little leery when people just start throwing around, you know, God told me do this. God said do this. Uh, it's God's will we do that. Because that's very subjective unless you can come back and put your finger objectively on book, chapter, and verse where the Lord himself, through the inspiration of Scripture, has explicitly communicated that truth. And so God gives life to the one sinning on behalf of the intercessor. Why is it so important that we pray for one another, especially when we see our brother sinning? Well, because of verses like Psalm 66 and verse 18. Because we know from the Bible that a believer's prayers can be hindered by their sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard, if I embrace sin, iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If I'm living in unrepentant sin, if I am living in rebellious sin, then my prayers are hindered my prayer life, my communication between me and God is hindered because of my habitual sinning and rebellion and refusal to turn from that sin. I think Lot, Lot is an excellent example. If it were not for the New Testament passage that lets us know that Lot's righteous soul was vexed daily and we only saw Lot in the Old Testament, I'd say Lot was a lost man. But Lot continued in sin, and the Bible tells us that his righteous soul was vexed, was convicted daily, that the Lord was working upon him, and that's why it was so crucial that Abraham intercede on his behalf. We are to, we are to pray for one another. God has called us to do this. And so we've seen the reason for intercession, our brother sinning. The result, God's going to answer. It's God's will. So God's going to give life on behalf of the intercessor to the one who's committing sin. And then the last part of verse 16 is this suggested restriction on intercession. There is a sin, he says, leading to death. And John says, I do not say that he should make request for this. And verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. Uh, simply warning against carelessness when it comes to sin. Because no sin is without consequences. And there is a sin not leading to death. And just encouraging his readers to continue in intercession that not all sin is unto death, and we don't know whether their sin is to death or not anyhow. And so we're to pray. Now these are difficult passages, and the difficulty of them may even be seen in my trying to, to teach and preach through them. But let me just try to just bring some summary to this. What is all of this business of sinning unto death and a sin not unto death? What is, what is John talking about? Let me give you two scenarios. Both are biblical. Either one could be the case. 
Number one, John can be writing about believers who are sinning unto physical death, such as Ananias and Sapphira, who what? Lied to God, and their sin was unto death, that before Peter, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Ghost, and fell dead and had to be buried? Not only Ananias and Sapphira, but look at the book of Corinthians, when Paul writes concerning the sickness and death that many sleep because of how they were half-heartedly, nonchalantly, carelessly using the Lord's table and the Lord's supper and were partaking in an unworthy manner and took something that was holy and sacred and was committing sin with it. And the Bible says many in the Corinthian church died because of their abuse of the Lord's table. They were sinning unto death. That could be exactly what John is talking about right here. And verse 16, the very end of that verse, John is just simply saying, if, if it's reached that point, I don't say that you should make requests for it because that's what God's going to do. And then in verse 17, he comes back around and he says, And all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. And he's simply saying, Look, we don't know what's going to be the outcome of this. We just know that all unrighteousness is sin. It's against God. We need to pray for our brother we see who's committing a sin because it may not be unto death. And if not, we want to see God bring them back into alignment with who they are to be in Christ. If not that, the second option is that John is writing concerning unbelievers who's conti who continually reject the gospel and in so doing they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit and therefore they perish in spiritual death. And so John is simply saying that all sins are forgivable and we are to intercede, but if they continue to reject the gospel, we know from Scripture that the unpardonable sin, the unfor unforgivable sin, is the individual who dies having continually rejected, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that as the Holy Spirit speaks of Christ and brings the truth of the gospel to an individual, that they reject it, and Hebrew says, even walk over it and trod it underfoot as an unclean thing. Many commentators and men wiser than me give those two scenarios. I lean toward the first. I believe what John is saying here is he's talking about believers. Because I believe brother in the sense of the beginning of verse 16 is dealing with that individual, that brother in the family of God. Not just human, humankind, the brotherhood of mankind, but in the family of God of God. And so this is the certainty that God answers prayer. Now I don't know if that excites you this morning. I don't know if when you walk out of here today you think, well, that was an all right service. But I want you to think about what we've looked at. You can know that you know that you're saved. And if you have that assurance this morning because you are saved and you do understand the truths of the gospel and what God's done for you in Jesus Christ, there is no price you can put on that. Praise God. And when I say praise God, I'm not talking about just churchy talk. I'm talking about praise God that we can know and then secondly, that while I'm not there yet, while my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't come today, while I'm still living in this life, while I'm still battling with sin, while I'm still fighting the old man and striving by the grace of God to live for the glory of God, that I have access to the throne room of God 
and can immediately be before his throne no matter where I am in prayer. Let me give you an image in closing because this is as far as we're going to go this morning. I've been in a few foreign countries and some of you have as well. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we are aliens. That's, that's the terminology that's used. That our citizenship is in heaven. And so we're not citizens of a sin-fallen world. This sin-fallen world that will one day be burned with fervent heat when God ushers in a new heaven and new earth and all the old is done away with, we're not citizens of this. We are what the Bible calls sojourners, aliens who are only in this world. So we are in a foreign country. And if you're around the world much at all, you become very conscious of that fact. Now, if you look like everybody, talk like everybody, and act like everybody and do everything that everybody else does, there's no uncomfort, no discomfort, because you blend right in. But let me tell you, when I went to Papua New Guinea, I didn't look like everybody. I sure didn't dress like everybody. Everybody's topless. And I didn't go topless at all. Huh? And I don't wear leaves and... And, and I don't go barefooted everywhere I go, even through the jungles and all. That was their culture. That's another country. That's a, that's a whole different thing. I was an alien. Everyone who saw me knew he's not from around here. <laughs> all right? They knew that. Well, the good thing is when you go into another country and you become intimidated or you become fearful for your life because you're a U.S. citizen and here in this foreign country, you're not sure of how the laws of that land will protect you. You're not sure of whether or not you're going to get out of there alive. You can go somewhere. And as soon as you enter into the building, onto the property of that place, it's as if you're back in the good old USA. You know what that place is called? the embassy. And if you can get in the embassy, then all of the rules and laws and protections of the United States government for you as a citizen of the United States are applicable to you there. And you're protected. And what we've seen here this morning is that as Christians who have been called out from the world. Come out from among them, says the Lord. Be different. Live for my glory. And so we don't look like, we don't talk like, we don't just blend in with the world. There's something different. We are followers of Christ. And anytime we need to, wherever we are, we can immediately enter into the embassy of heaven and have direct access to the Lord God himself in prayer. And that's what John wants his readers to know. I've written all that I have so that you can know that you have eternal life. And I want you to know that whatever we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we receive what we've asked for. Because God not only answers prayer, God can not only answer that simple prayer, God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. God's going to see to it that his children, living for his glory, are taken care of. But you know what? We're going to stumble and we're going to fall. And that's why as the family of God, we are to surround one another. And we are to even pray for those that we see sinning and living in sin. That they might be brought back in. 
and Lord willing not be committing a sin even unto death and we've seen that haven't we it's sad to say but I'm I, w I would dare say that the majority of us in here have seen individuals who have wasted and squandered their life and rather than living their life for the glory of God they lived it for the temporary pleasures of sin and about the only confidence that we have that they were truly saved is that we could clearly see the chastening hand of God upon their life and that's tough to say but the writer of Hebrews says that God chastens those he loves and if an individual is without chastisement, if they're without getting weapons from God, so to speak, then they are bastards and not sons. If you can live in ongoing sin just without any repercussions and without any consequences, it ought to strike the fear of God in you because that is just a testimony to the fact that you don't belong to him. Because God brings his children back. This morning as we prepare to have an invitational song, I just want to ask you once again, do you have the absolute assurance of salvation? And if your answer to that is yes, what's it based on? Is it based on what you've been told all your life that because you simply prayed a prayer, were baptized, joined the church, did some external act that you have assurance or can you go back to the word of God where it really counts and where it really matters and say my assurance is based upon the foundation of what this Bible says if not you can have if you'll repent and believe and for those of us who are saved may we rejoice in the assurance that's ours and may we take full advantage of the privilege that we have in prayer because the most neglected privilege that we have as Christians is prayer we even put stickers on our car that says when all else fails pray why wait till everything else fails we should have been praying beforehand we should have been praying in the middle of it we should be praying after the fact you see, well, we don't want to wait till all else fails. We want to pray without ceasing, which means that we want to be in constant God consciousness and communication with the Lord. You don't have to bow and fold your hands to be in prayer. There's many a times I've sat across the desk and someone be telling me their story and, and seeking counsel and the whole time I'm listening to them, I'm praying in my mind, in my heart, Lord, please give me wisdom. Please give me discernment to be able to help this person with the Word of God. Bring to my memory the things that you have said and taught me in the Word of God so that I can direct them. I don't say hold on a minute and have to kneel and pray or throw out a rug and get down on the rug and pray. Listen, there are postures of reverence and all that are fine, but to pray without ceasing and take advantage of this privilege called prayer just means that we live in constant God consciousness Lord that was good that's what I've thought sometimes when I've gotten a shake out of you know Chick-fil-a has some of the best shakes you can get and you know right there in my mind in my heart Lord that was good thank you for that and so in every way we can pray without ceasing let's pray now